A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The desert and the parched land will exalt. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the hands that are feeble, make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap like a stag, then the tongue of the mute will sing. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness, sorrow and mourning will flee. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the letter of St. James. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You too must be patient. Make your hearts firm because the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not complain, brothers and sisters, about one another, that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing before the gates. Take as an example of hardship and patience, brothers and sisters, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When John the Baptist heard in prison of the works of the Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus with this question Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine Clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the perennial challenges in Jesuit community is the challenge of getting your hands on a car, okay? Because typically, there's a, like it is in most religious communities, there's a big bunch of people and just one car. So, for instance, in theology, 
we had eight guys in the house and one car to share between us. And you didn't really need a car that much. Living where we lived, you could get around by bicycle, you could get to school by bicycle, all that. But once in a while, you just really wanted to get out of town, you know? You just really wanted to get out of town. And so when, you, when that could work, when it could line up and it could really happen, it was, it was terrific. It was a great gift. So came one summer, I was working, I was, stayed there for the summer working in a place down in the square. And it all lined up, and I was able to get a car and line things up, and I made arrangements to leave work at noon so I'd be out before the big Boston rush hour and hopefully down, you know, I don't know how you go back and if you go to Boston, but Mass Pike, 84 through Hartford, 684 down through Westchester, the Hutch, Cross County, snake around on the Hudmy Hudson, and then you just creep right up on the GW and you're home before you know it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good theory. So the goal was to be out of there but at the latest, like one o'clock, absolute latest. And at about 12.30, the boss's boss comes in and needs a data set, I'll never forget it, about um, tanker capacity in and out of Singapore. And it was an emergency. And I'm thinking, the classic case, your lack of planning is not my emergency but you signed my paycheck, so let me go ahead and figure out exactly what it is that you need. I couldn't be happier to do it. And by the time I got out of there, it was about, I don't know, 10 after four. So what should have been, I had the whole thing figured out. It's gonna be out of there by, you know, one o'clock, be down at the shore the latest, five o'clock, six o'clock, no problem at all. Accident on the Mass Pike, construction on 84, another accident on 684, so by the time I got down to the hutch and was trying to come over the bridge, it was probably 8 o'clock and there was some, for some reason, one of the levels of the bridge was closed so everybody had to go over the same level. So it's one of those classic cases. The clothes that you were wearing that were perfectly fine when you got in the car are out of style when you get out of the car, <laughs> right? So I finally get down to home and pull up to my parents' place and the way it was, you had to kind of drive a little bit past the house to get the driveway and then come back and it had a sort of a curve in it. And when you take the curve around, the headlights fall on the garage and there, and I had called my parents several times along the way and say, you know, when in Hartford said, forget it, I'm not gonna be there for dinner. And then uh, somewhere down in, in Westchester, I don't think I'm gonna be there at all. And you know, then I get over the bridge to that last standing golf station up by the GW and I said, I think I'll be there at around 10.30 or so. Well, I pull around and the headlights flash up on the garage. And what to my wondering eyes should appear? There's my little sister Judith in a beach chair with a turkey sandwich <laughs> waiting for me to get there, right? And all of a sudden, all of the frustration and the road agitation and the, you know, every, who cares, right? When you're in the presence of that kind of faithfulness. Faithfulness, as we know from our tradition, is different from faith. Faithfulness is that way of, it's a gift from God that enables us to continually love others in ways so that our choices are organized around their well-being. When we get this gift of faithfulness from God, it enables us to make choices so that our choices consider the beloved's well-being. Now, let me tell you, by 10.30 or quarter to 11, Judith would much rather have been in bed. I mean, she was an early to bed, early to rise kind of gal. So when I pulled in there at 10.30 and she had the turkey sandwich that she had made herself and she was so tuned up about it and this transistor radio that I still have somewhere down there, um, it, it's, a, it's a cassette thing too and she was really, she was the, like the DJ with this stuff. And uh, what was the song she had going for me? Oh, uh, Van Morrison, The Wild Night Is Calling. So, and that's a whole separate story in itself. Boy, was that just a great thing. You've had those experiences of faithfulness. Now, when we th think of the word faithfulness, easy, it's so easy to, to mush it together with marriage and romance and monogamy and all that. It's, that's all a piece of faithfulness, but the gift of faithfulness is much, much bigger. Faith is the gift from God that enables us to say yes to Jesus Christ, to believe, to be convinced that everything he said is true, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the gift of faith. When we receive it, we can profess our creed with great conviction. Faithfulness, when we receive that fruit of the Holy Spirit, we consider the other's well-being when we make our choices. Isaiah. Isaiah is a great place for us to start because Isaiah shows us that it all starts, or reminds us that it all starts with God's faithfulness. 
that when God makes the choices, God is considering the well-being of the nation of Israel. And that's the way it always was and always would be. And so here we have chapter 35 of Isaiah, and that's important because chapters 34 and 35 are a break in this sort of hostile narrative of what God is going to do to the neighbors of Israel and what God's going to do to Israel. But here in chapter 34 and 35, today we hear 35, 1 to 10. In this section, we hear the Lord's reminder, you know what? I really care about your well-being. And that's a stark contrast to chapter 33, because in chapter 33, God is telling the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the rest of them, the Moabites, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess you up, <laughs> right? I'm going to turn your farms into wastelands, and I'm going to dry up your rivers, and you're not going to have any more fish to catch. So the Lord is not faithful to those other nations. Let's be really clear. The Lord, the way it's portrayed in Isaiah, the Lord is not faithful to those other nations, but the Lord is faithful to Israel. And in being faithful to Israel, the Lord's going to do two things. It's the first part and the second part of the passage. In the first part, the Lord is going to express that faithfulness by making it possible for people to come home from the Babylonian captivity to Mount Zion. That's a very intimidating possibility of going across the desert. So once again, the Lord says, I'm going to smooth it out. I'm going to make the, the streams are going to bubble up. And once you get there, it's not going to be a wasteland. It'll be like Sharon and Carmel, which is to say to the people of like the Yucca Flats, your place is going to look like Seattle, right? What was so burned out and, and dried up is going to be a lush place with lots of growth. And children of Israel, when you get there, it's going to be beautiful. And the trip across is going to be safe. I'm going to make all my choices with your well-being in mind. And God's going to transform the landscape. The second part of today's passage goes from the landscape considerations to the people. And the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to make the deaf to hear and the blind to see. And people who can't walk are going to be able to walk. All my choices are organized around the well-being of my chosen people. All my choices, God is saying, are organized around my love for you. It might not always seem apparent, but it's always the case. God's faithfulness is where it starts. There's a prayer that used to be in the second Eucharistic prayer for reconciliation that got taken out of the book when they did it, and I'm sorry about that, and there's some other good stuff that we lost, but, you know, progress is progress. And that prayer said, Lord, Almighty God, from the beginning of time, you have always done what is good for us. What a marvelous prayer that is and was. Lord, from the beginning of time, you have always done what is good for us. And that Isaiah passage reminds us, both in terms of making the landscape agreeable and in terms of helping people, the Lord has always done what is good for us. And then in the gospel, we get the story of Jesus' faithfulness to John the Baptist. Jesus' faithfulness to John the Baptist is a powerful thing. The only clue we get about John the Baptist here in Matthew 11 is that John was in jail. We know from chapter 4 that John was arrested, but Matthew doesn't detail it until chapter 14. Here in the middle, in chapter 11, we only know that John was in jail. John was in jail because of that, that fracas that he had with Herod's wife and all that bit. So now they come from jail from John's the Baptist friends, and they come out and they say, so who are you? Are you the Christ? And Jesus, in his faithfulness to John the Baptist, has to clarify it. And Jesus is putting himself at risk here. Because this is the first time he's saying in a semi-public open forum, I kind of am the one that John has been waiting for. I'm not the fiery Messiah who's going to get rid of the Romans. But I, you tell John that the blind can see and the deaf can hear and, and, the, and the people who couldn't walk can now walk. These are the acts of the Messiah. So go ahead. I want John to know that. It might end up backfiring on me. Me saying this about myself might get me into trouble, but I care enough about John the Baptist, and I want him to know that his efforts were not in vain. And so there you have Jesus' faithfulness to John the Baptist, who he, he might have met once or twice, and there's no real clarity about that. You know, John knows that he baptized Jesus, but... Did they go to family reunions? Doesn't seem like they did. But Jesus is faithful to him. He wants John the Baptist to know that, to know that in, in case you, you, you're killed in this process, John, what you did was worth it. And then in the second part of the gospel, Jesus goes beyond his message to John and starts to deliver a message about John. 
And what he says is it all comes together with there's never been anybody born who's been greater than John the Baptist. Never. That could get him in trouble again. Think about it. John is in jail. John ran afoul of Herod. And now Jesus is saying he's the greatest guy who ever lived. Wow, Jesus, you're really putting yourself out on a limb there. That's right. But because of his faithfulness to John the Baptist, he's willing to tell people who John the Baptist is, even if it gets him in trouble. Once again, Jesus' faithfulness to John the Baptist. So where do we go with it, huh? This gift of faithfulness. We see it in, in the time before Christ. We see it in the life of Christ. We see it in the death of Christ. Remember that very moving passage from the book of glory in John's gospel. He always loved those who were his own in the world, and he loved them until the end. Holy smokes. He was always faithful, even until the end. To make that real to us, let's just go and see the way that gift has come into our lives. And so the first question, the first question for everybody is, who who are those people who make God's faithfulness real to you, who have made it real to you? Who have been those people in your life where you look at them and you say, you know what? They did organize their choices around my well-being. And it might be the unexpected candidates. It might be the logical candidates, those members of your family, those closest to us, to you, the nearest and the dearest. And it might be someone else altogether. But if you had to name the top four or five people who really had a lifetime of faithfulness to you, that is, their choices considered your well-being. Not to say your well-being monopolized their choices, but it was a serious consideration. And they always took it into mind. Who are some of those people who've received the gift of faithfulness and used it on your behalf? Second question, take one from column A and one from column B. You've you got to do this one, but this one you can take your choice. First option, first option. For whom have you used your gift of faithfulness the most? Where have you taken that gift, that fruit of the Holy Spirit, and put it into action in the world by organizing your choices around the well-being of others? Name a couple of people where you've truly been faithful. And again, leave it out of the romance zone. That's not the guts of faithfulness. It's a subset of it, but it's not the core of it. Who are some of those people where you've received the gift and you can look and say, wow, I could only do that because I received this fruit of the Holy Spirit? Second question is, are there people who need to be reminded these days, especially during the holidays, of your faithfulness to them? Maybe they're feeling disconnected. Maybe they're feeling left out. Maybe they're feeling whatever, and they just need to be reminded. I'm not in touch with you all the time. You don't hear from me every day. But I want you to know that your well-being matters to me, and it influences my choices. Who's been really faithful to you in a way that helps you understand God's faithfulness? To whom have you been faithful? To whom might you be more faithful? It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a gift from God. It doesn't mean there's a lot of fireworks and, you know, supernatural phenomenon and all this stuff when the gift is given. It's not about a lot of display. It's about something as quiet as a turkey sandwich at the end of an eight-hour drive in a car with no air conditioner. (laughs) So last week reminded us that happiness and joy are related but two different things. Joy is that gift from God. Happiness is that spontaneously generated human experience. This week, it's a similar thing. What's the relationship between faith and faithfulness? Faith is a gift from God. It's one of the theological virtues. It enables us to say yes to Jesus Christ. It's about conviction. Faithfulness is about the way we love. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It means that we continue to consider other people's well-being when we make our choices just like God did for the children of ancient Israel, just like Jesus did for John the Baptist. It doesn't mean we go into a neurotic state of thinking we have to save the world. We don't. That's of the dark side. That's not of God. But it is an invitation to consider those ways in which perhaps 
we are invited to be a little bit more faithful. Again, not in a romantic sense, but in the very clear sense of, am I really truly considering that other person's well-being when I make my choices? Who's done a bang-up job of that for you in your life? Received the gift and used it well on your behalf. For whom have you used the gift very well? You've loved them faithfully and your, your choices consistently reflect their well-being. And where might you do a little bit better job of it? Next week, it's back to purple. Let us pray. <laughs>